Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. It's too bad they took that picture off there because I wanted to pose for it. Uh, based on the subject I have to address, I want to put my own head in my hands and say, why me, Lord? But uh, so it is, I've been asked to speak on this extremely difficult topic. Uh, some years ago, I was in Pittsburgh, and uh, I was in an elevator, some businessmen heading out for the evening, I think, and uh, I had my Bible and my lecture notes in my hand, and so one of them said, are you going to speak somewhere? I said, yes. He said, what are you speaking on? I said, the problem of pleasure. And there was silence, and one of them said, I didn't know that was a problem. <laughs> and I said to him, that tells you how big a problem it really is. Uh, I'm sure if I had answered on the problem of pain, somebody would have said, can I get a CD? Or what are you going to say about it? Because I have no doubt that even in the pursuit of pleasure, you end up oftentimes in a lot of pain. And the whole question of pain becomes that big mountain that you don't know how to climb in your life. How do you really get over onto the other side? The fact of the matter is, uh, one of the things that uh, Joel had said uh, just struck me as he was talking about it, that in my field of study in world religions, I have uh, research this in many in many a worldview be it Buddhism in fact Buddhism was uh, built upon the notion of dukkha or suffering or pain that began Gautama Buddha's entire pursuit to find answers and then of course in Hinduism uh, the whole issue of karma and reincarnation is also often fatalistically assigned to the role of every life every birth being a rebirth and every rebirth being some sort of payment for the previous birth. Uh, Islam uh, notoriously does not say too much about it but if and when it does it oftentimes muddies the waters and loses the distinction between what is a blessing and what is a curse because even a curse is sort of accepted as a privilege and a blessing. Uh, there's a high degree of a predestinarian worldview in every particular aspect of life. If you want to see the details and the footnotes and the explanations on that, I would urge you to, to, to get a hold of our book called Why Suffering, which uh, I have co-authored with my colleague from Oxford, Vince Vitale. Vince uh, did his master's here at, uh, in the United States at Princeton and then did his doctoral work at Oxford and his entire dissertation was on that theme of suffering and his very notable professor was in attendance when the book was released and both of us gave a little bit of introduction in fact it was a very well attended event with several of Oxford faculty and so on coming to listen to why that book was written and uh, obviously his own mentor really appreciated the insights that Vince gave in that book so I encourage you to get a hold of it if you can whenever you finish a book you always say you know what I should have said something else too because you always gain insights when you read it in its final product and you say you know what this was not as clear as I would like to have been even though you reread it a hundred times and finally say you know the deadline has come you've done it but even since writing that I've thought a lot about the subject how do I deal with this how do I proceed to address it uh, was it not Tennyson who said never morning war to evening but that some heart did break never morning war to evening but that some heart did break uh, I go all over the globe and see so many people in abject suffering deprivation want loss of life loss of health and uh, you know I'm a tender-hearted guy and when I see some of that I find a corner somewhere and literally put my own head in my hands and say, how do I help this person? How do I answer this? Not all problems can be solved monetarily. Sometimes all the money in the world cannot relieve you of some pain that you have experienced. Because pain is sort of a very deep-seated reality. Not just in physical terms, but emotional, spiritual terms. And sometimes the pain may have nothing to do with you, other than the fact you are witnessing it and want to find an answer for why someone has to go through that. 
So I've done that philosophically, I've done that from various points of view, I've done that in some of my writings. What I'd like to do is take you to one of the oldest books in the Bible and see how he processed it because there's a lot more in here than comes to our mind immediately once you start reading this. I mean it's a densely textured book. There are so many questions that arise even right from the introduction. What is God really saying here? What is happening behind the scenes? But we know the basic drama of this. Job has lost all of his possessions, he's lost his family, and finally he has lost his own physical well-being. He is covered from head to toe with sores, and he is about to talk to God, and his wife comes and gives him some advice in chapter 2 and verse 9. His wife said to him, are you still holding on to your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you're talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. At this point, he is literally holding on to the slender thread of a totally sovereign God. But what he is agonized with is his theological assumptions. Be good and be blessed. Be bad and be cursed. Be good and be blessed be bad and be cursed. He says, all right, God is sovereign. I've received all of this. What I want to know is, why am I receiving it? If I have done wrong, explain it to me, please. David Hume put it in these words. Were a stranger to suddenly drop into this world, I would show him as a specimen of its ills, a hospital full of diseases, a prison crowded with malefactors and debtors, a field strewn with carcasses, a fleet floundering in the ocean, a nation languishing under tyranny, famine or pestilence. Honestly, I don't see how you can possibly square with an ultimate purpose of love. That last line is almost a metaphysical giveaway. I'm not quite sure if Hume really had thought through that very statement because even love needs an ontic referent. It needs some objective definition. And in the naturalistic framework, how do you even assume that love can have a point of reference objectively but so goes Hume and he says I would show a stranger all that surround us how can there be ultimately a purpose of love I think it was Camus who said this it is not science that has led me to doubt the purpose of God it is the state of this world it is this pitiless unending struggle for existence among the nations it is the collapse of our idealisms before the brute facts of force and chaos it is the feeling that there is something demonic in the heart of things which is working against us that there is a radical twist in the very constitution of the universe which will ultimately defeat, defeat man's hopes make havoc of his dreams and bring his pathetic optimism crashing in disaster purpose look at the world that settles it so what are the two notions they have introduced in their last line for Hume it is love for Camus as an existential thinker he's looking for purpose meaning and that's really what it is all about trying to make sense out of it all one philosopher puts it as a trilemma for Christians and considers it an evidential argument against the existence of God not just an a uh, question to defend the theism but he says the reality of evil provides evidence against the existence of God how so with the trilemma Christians say God is all-powerful Christians say God is all-loving and yet sin exists that's the trilemma an all-powerful God an all-loving God the reality of evil and of course my immediate response when I read that, uh, I think it's Mackey who pr produces that, I say to him, to him, why have you just taken three assumptions of the Christian faith? Why is it not a quadlemma? Why is it not a quintilemma? A quadlemma could say God is also all wise. Does not the wisdom of God bring in a completely different component to the paradigmatic problem? And God, the fifth one, God lives in eternity. 
Does not time play a factor here in understanding pain and suffering? If you take a child, just about a year old, and you take that child to the doctor and he's about to get jabbed with big needles, my mother is all loving. My mother has the power to either take me into this building or take me out of this building. <laughs> Why on earth has she taken me into the building where this man is going to jab and hurt me? Takes a few years for the child to find out, ah, now I know. I came, I've come here from Ottawa, Canada, where I spoke at the 50th anniversary of the Canadian Parliamentary Prayer Breakfast, and a fantastic gathering. 50 years it's been going. And the night before at the dinner, Dr. Kent Brantley spoke. Some of you may know his name, the doctor who contracted Ebola when he was in Africa. It has been seldom that I've heard such a riveting testimony of the power of God in the life of a totally committed man who understood his calling. He's a physician, and there in just somber tones, yet plain speaking language, told of the horror that struck his body. And as he described it, and all that had to be done to him, to put him in, in, in the same, to that protective suit and fly him out from there and bring him to Emory. And all that went on to ultimately rid him of that dreaded disease would have taken, that would have taken his life. What if he were a child and you had to explain all that you were doing to that child? Time becomes a component. Understanding becomes a component. To say there's a trilemma is actually trivializing the problem. It is much more complex than just three propositions from the Christian faith. And here it is. Job struggles and he begins to complain. And the biggest problem he had right at the beginning was his friends. I would never dream of giving my son the name Eliphaz, Bildad or Zophar. <laughs> they simply don't look good. And the best thing they did was when they sat silent for a few days, just sitting by his bed. The problem began when they opened their mouths. There's a lot going on here. And that's why he even comments on what kind of miserable comforters are you? You boys are supposed to be my friends. Friends should at least try to defang the pain in some way. So the first one, Eliphaz, the oldest, begins with an incredible story. I don't know which church he went to, but he begins by this. He says, a spirit glided past my face. The hair of my face stood up. As soon as he would have begun like that, if I was sitting on an ash pile, I'd say, please, Lord, help me. Where is this boy going? He first, the spirit glided past my face, the hair on my face stood up, and it stood still. But I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes, there was silence, and then I heard a voice, can mortal man be righteous before God? Can a man be pure before his maker? All right, here's Job, you're, you're sitting head to toe with boils, and I come to you and say, I want to tell you something. A spirit glided past my face, the hair on my body just stood up, you know, there was silence, and he probably was saying, I wish you'd do the same. And then, <clears throat> then the Spirit spoke, can a man be pure before his maker? Can a man be righteous before God? Even if it were true, there's a problem here. I remember uh, my professor of uh, the history of Christian thought in my graduate school days. Some of you may, may know the name, but he had seven earned degrees. Three of them were doctorates, uh, Dr. Montgomery. We used to pray before we went to class because he used to give half of the grade for the questions we asked in class. And we'd think up half, sit up half the night thinking up of questions. And uh, then he gave us the exam and I had a problem. I didn't understand a single of his question. And I kept looking at this saying, what am I going to do? I don't even know what he's asking me for. But the bothersome thing was the guy in the next desk was writing away furiously, hardly breathing between sentences and going on and on and on and on. I said, what's the matter? He's writing, taking more sheets, ripping more sheets, running out. I've yet to comprehend what he's asking me to write about. So on the day when we got our marks back, I wanted to see what he got. And when Dr. Montgomery handed it back, 
he looked at his sheet of paper. You know, in, in India, when we grew up and we didn't know the answer to something, we'd write as much as we think was possibly remotely connected to the subject. <laughs> and in the volume of words would be some hint in the direction. We used to call it padding, padding, just pad, you know, just say all that you think needs to be said. And somewhere you may say what the professor wants to see. Well, he padded it. And Dr. Montgomery, just in red ink, wrote this one line. This is not right. <laughs> this is not even wrong. <laughs> you see, if you say something is right, you're assuming something's been said. If you say something is wrong, again you're assuming something's been said. When it does not even rise to the dignity of an error, that's when you say, this is not even wrong. <laughs> what do you say to a man like Eliphaz? So Job just comes back and he says this, you know what? A despairing man should have the devotion of his friends. Please don't leave me to suffer like this. And then he says, your speeches are heartless. You would even cast, cast lots upon orphans. All right, if I have sinned, tell me why I'm not being pardoned. I won't argue against it. Why am I being punished? Then he comes out with this line, teach me and I will hold my peace. Lead me to understand. So he's, Eliphaz is done with his speech. And then comes Bildad, he's a little more cruel. He calls Job a windbag. And then he says, inquire, I pray thee, of the former age, and apply myself to that which the fathers have searched out. They shall utter words out of the past. Again, it's good counsel, but it's simply not getting to where Job's at. Inquire of the past. Augustine has written on these issues. Luther has written on these issues. So many great thinkers have written on these issues. Inquire of them what it is they really said. Yes. It helps. One of my professors <clears throat> at Trinity was a man by the name of Feinberg, Dr. Feinberg. His master's thesis, his doctoral dissertation was on the problem of evil and the problem of pain. I quoted him in my book. I had no idea what he, following all of that, went through with his family as his wife contracted a most dreaded disease in which gradually you lose all capacity and then to their horror they found, find out <clears throat> that it is passed on from generation to generation and he became terrified about what his children would face and Dr. Feinberg said with all of my reading and all of my knowledge and all of my breadth of understanding when this news came to me I was floored I didn't know where to go with it and that's the reality. You understand that. I understand that. I've been through some of it myself. And every time it happens, I say, this is hard, Lord. I don't know how I'm going to climb this hill. You understand what's going on? I don't. And so as Bildad says, inquire of the former age, Job's response is this. Look, is his power arbitrary? Does he really, at whim, inflict this stuff? He says, I don't go doubt God's existence. I'm just wondering about his purpose. And then he says, how can I be just before God? He says, why doesn't he just leave me alone? Not bother with me. Why this? And then he comes out with this. Is there an umpire between God and me? Somebody who can plead my cause before him. And so Eliphaz's speech ends with Job asking for understanding. Now he's coming a little more to a point. He says, I want to know if there's somebody who can stand before God on my behalf and plead my case. Now comes Zophar, the youngest, and he's the rudest. And he goes on to say, you know what, Job? We've really got a problem. It is easier for a, God, for a donkey that to learn wisdom than for us to teach you an idiot. How do we teach you? 
How are we going to get through to you? And then he says, don't you understand, Job? Your ways are not God's ways. His ways are not yours. Again, it's true. We know that. God's ways are not our ways. Job is just trying to wrestle with purpose, trying to wrestle with representation. And now he comes to a series of questions and he says this. Talk to me, God. What have I done? Is there a clue? And then he comes with this statement to his friends, when you boys die, wisdom is going to die with you. you. See what's happened? Those who came to help have suddenly become his tormentors because they are missing something very important. I've learned in years of visiting places where an awful lot of pain is being experienced. You're better off remaining silent and just shedding your tears with that individual than saying something that is going to just hurt even more. <clears throat> In the book I give this illustration. I've had two major back surgeries. If any one of you has lived with major back issues, you know the kind of pain you can have. And for there were days where even after my surgery I'd be sitting in my car going to meet my wife or children for dinner and I'd be sitting there in a parking spot and lean on the steering wheel and just cry. The pain was so agonizing. I have two titanium rods from L3 to S1, four clamps, eight screws bolting me down. I injured it very badly many, many years ago and all those years went by with a lot of pain. And as I have struggled with that, I've just found out that Sometimes all you really need is a helping arm around your shoulder or something during those days. But here's what I want to tell you. I tell this story in my book. After my back surgery, you know, it's a heavy padding they put on there and uh, I, I couldn't move. For about four days I couldn't move. Actually that was the second one because the dura, the lining tore and uh, trying to mend that was a challenge and he said for four days you can't move, you have to lie totally motionless. He says if you need to turn we'll send a couple of nurses and they will try to turn you together. So I went and uh, lay down and about two days go by and I say I wish I could just lie on my back for a minute or two you know. So I called uh, an orderly he brought another man and they're very skillfully with a sheet under them they turned me to my side all for about two three minutes and then I had to come back middle of the night I said I just have to turn so I called the nurse and she said alright I'll try and turn you I said ma'am it took two pretty tough guys to do it in the afternoon can you bring another nurse to help you you're gonna need two I don't think you can do it all by yourself she said no 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 I'm very experienced I said, the way they did it, it needed two of them to hold a sheet, you know. She said, you know what, I've been a nurse long enough, so I wasn't going to argue. She rammed her hands underneath my back. I will not tell you the thoughts in my mind, but I will tell you that I screamed. And you know what she said? You've had back surgery. I thought you'd come for a hip replacement. Unbelievable. <laughs> the next day when I told the doctor that, I won't tell you what he said. He stormed out of that room because that place could not be touched. You touch a healing wound in a wrong way, you will do greater damage than any intent you may have had in your heart. And I've come to this conclusion. Be wise in what you say, when you say it. So, Job comes directly to God. And now to the silence, God answers him. And God asks him 64 questions back to back, which was the last thing Job wanted. He wanted answers. And God, God says, all right, I'll talk to you now like a man. Where were you when the foundations of the earth were laid? Were you there when all of the boundaries were set? And on and on and on, a series of questions on the intricacy 
and the fine-tuning and the majesty of this world something like the psalmist said you know when I look at the world the heavens and the work of your hands the the moon and the stars which you have made what is there in man that you shall keep him, that you keep him in mind the whole fascinating world around us Job do you really understand all of that since you're telling me you will only accept that which you can totally comprehend let me give you a little test right from the beginning tell me how you comprehend this world around you do you understand the intricacies of all this God is opening him up within his own assumptions when you question a questioner you determine the entry point to the discussion and you open up the questioner within their own assumptions that's exactly what God's doing here do you really only take all of that which you truly understand <clears throat> you know this whole revelation is for God to reveal to Job that he is the creator and the designer he is the creator and the designer now I understand that in our sophistication with a scientific single vision that we want to give to this world those are two concepts that are not very popular in the scientific world even scientists like uh, Vikramasinghe and Hoyle when they wrote their book evolution from space what did they say Vikrama Singer from Sri Lanka is a Buddhist which is a non-theistic religion Sir Frederick Hoyle was a skeptic, an astronomer brilliant minds, brilliant minds <clears throat> they go on to say the mathematical impossibility of just the protein formation is so astronomical that Hoyle says it boils down and Vikrama Singer mathematician says it is so preposterous given the time to think that all this can come together in just in the protein formation that he would consider it impossible to explain evolution in an earth bound theory he's not dispensing with evolution so what he's saying he said in an earth bound theory there has to be something transcendent from here that's when they he posited the panspermian theory that spores from another planet were brought to seed the earth Hoyle didn't want to buy that at that time but Hoyle also accepted it Francis Crick has accepted it that spores from another planet this is the Nobel laureate he says maybe in a spaceship or whatever I won't even I, won't, I don't even want to go in that direction I just want to say to you we make a mistake when we misposition the idea of evolution as if evolution is pitting itself against creation it may it may and it may not evolution to me is a theory of processes I'm now talking about beginnings beginnings my professor of quantum John Pokinghorn at Cambridge University the, 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 the Dean of uh, Queen's College, Cambridge. Pokinghorn's a late comer to Christ. In his book, One World, he talks about all the precision required and the contingencies for the early picoseconds of the universe. Here's what he says with just one of them. He said, if you take the expansion and contraction rate, this is one of the issues that, Ho that Hawking wrestles with too. But if you take the early picoseconds of the expansion and contraction rate of the universe, he says the exactitude demanded was so perfect and the margin of error so small that one slight number off and the universe would have collapsed he said the exactitude demanded would be like taking aim at a one square inch object at the other end of the known universe 20 billion light years away and hitting it bullseye so you've got a quantum physicist, you've got a mathematician, you've got an astronomer, all of them saying the numbers alone are so huge. So what am I saying to you? I'm just saying to you that the creator-designer idea 
in the Judeo-Christian worldview is not a far-fetched idea and let me explain to you as an entailment of this what I mean. Stephen Hawking's story told in, uh, in, the, in the movie that has come, The Theory of Everything. I, I did some of my work at Cambridge <clears throat> and had the privilege of hearing him a few times, seeing him being wheeled around and taken. Brilliant mind, genius, absolute genius. But I want to ask you this, would Stephen Hawking have ever lived if there had not somebody who designed some equipment for him to speak and to take care of him in his medical need? Would Stephen Hawking have survived if he didn't have a wife of all those years who loved him and all those who came around him to love him? Two categories designing engineers and loving friends those two categories really ought to be jettisoned in a naturalistic framework within which Hawking wants to explain all of everything. Love is a metaphysical notion. It doesn't come to us from physics or chemistry. It's the great reality that you and I long for, need, hunger for. I watched it and as a youngster growing up and my need for it and the lack of it led me to a bed of suicide when I was 17. I watched it in our children growing up. Now I'm watching it with four grandchildren and watching the affection and the longing and the love that they long for and experience. It is not explainable with physical quantities it is a transcendent notion of our greatest need. So when we talk about a creator designer, we immediately bring in, bring in the fact that there's a designed purpose for love. And even the fact that Job is looking for logic and answers is the way we've been hardwired by God to think things through. Creator, designer. Secondly, he comes to him <clears throat> as revealer and comforter. Revealer and comforter. When he comes to him as revealer comforter, he, God, he, God says to him, he says, you know, uh, he says that uh, I had heard of you by the hearing of my ear. Now I have seen you. I abhor myself and I'm horrified. What I say to you is this. The Judeo-Christian worldview is the only worldview where the experience of the living God and His grace is given to us in a personal relationship to which He calls us. I hope you heard what I said because the answers are sometimes beyond propositional. The answers come in a relationship and that relationship is what the Redeemer offers to you and to me in that indwelling presence. We don't hear much about it these days because it's not very popular. <clears throat> I was speaking at a, one of the, our Ivy League schools and one uh, man had written quite a, one student had written quite a hostile article and one of his criticisms was anecdotal arguments. So I took note of that and I smiled and uh, I picked him out in the audience because I said somebody wrote an article about some of the arguments being very anecdotal and the girl sitting next to him went this way so I got him, you know. <clears throat> so I went on. I said if I ask you why you don't believe in God one of your answers may be you've seen so much of suffering and I'll say what do you mean? You'll say you know my uncle's brother's friend's son somewhere and you'll tell me some story of somebody you saw suffering very much. Will you resort to an anecdotal argument or stay purely in the logic of it? I said, I'll ask you this, when you remove an anecdotal argument, do you know what you're actually doing? You're doing away with almost all of Hinduism. The Mahabharata, the Gita, it's all anecdotal. You're doing away with all of Sunni Islam, it's all anecdotal. 
I said, let's not live in this cerebral ivory tower where we think an argument is purely uh, the, you, you've got uh, to posit uh, the, the, a major premise, a minor premise, validity and deduction. I said, that is valid, I understand. But so much of life is lived out at the existential level and at the relational level. And we must bridge the two between argument and experience and in the Christian worldview the experience is so real but the argument goes beyond that and let me illustrate this for you it's fascinating to me Peter gets up to the mountain and to him is given an experience of the tra of the transfiguration of the Lord it is an amazing thing to be witnessing vouchsafed to three disciples Peter James and John so overwhelming is that as the body of Christ glows with the whitest whiteness that you can imagine that he's blinded and he falls on his face and after it is over he looks at he, he looks at Jesus and says let's stay here let's not go down he wants to live in the immediate afterglow permanently of what he just experienced this is the same Peter who writes and says we were I witnesses to his majesty but now we have the word of the prophets made more certain and you will do well to pay heed to it as light in a dark place ladies and gentlemen Christ brings in your life both the argument and the experience <clears throat> Sometimes, some, sometimes I hear something like this, you know, people, Dawkins' this argument, you were born in India, you know, you'd be a Hindu if you're born here in such a place. I don't know where he comes up with his statistics, but it's unbelievable, you know. The fastest growing church in the world today is in China, not exactly a bedrock of Christendom. You know. but it's the fastest growing church in the world there. When I came to Jesus Christ, I was a 17-year-old, misguided, hopeless, lost individual. Lost. And a man brought a Bible into my hospital room. I had never opened a Bible on my own in my life. It's a long story. I've told it in my book, Walking from East to West, so those of you read it understand it. But here it is. As that verse is being read to me, and I trust in Christ. I was 17 years old then. I turned 69 last month. 52 years later, the vibrancy of that relationship only throbs harder and harder and harder in my life. It's so real. I was telling the folks in Ottawa, my sister who's married to a pastor now in Toronto, Canada, my sister and all knew who I was, what I lived like. We grew up together. And she'd just gone somewhere in the world where somebody had said their lives had been changed by some comments I'd made, books written, I don't know, forget where it was. And she said, Ravi, I just want to tell you something. I know Dad was ruthless with you. And I know he used to try to hurt you by saying, you're going to end up in jail one day. I just want you to know what dad didn't see, your heavenly father did. And so I ask you, have you truly come to that point of getting on your knees and making that commitment which will so transform your life and give you new hungers and new hopes? Paul writing in 2 Corinthians 12 he says you know what I had an experience 14 years ago I'd love to tell you about it but it is in the body or out of the body I couldn't tell this man was lifted up into paradise I'd love to talk about it but I won't all I want to talk about is I had some thorns in the flesh that I wished would go away and I now know that he's made his strength perfect in my weakness and his grace is sufficient for me that's the word grace and so Annie Johnston Flint born 
a little girl, orphaned, raised by the Bonnie Johnston, raised by the Flint family, early in life contracted rheumatoid arthritis, then cancer, then blindness, then incontinence. She lay in bed with eight pillows cushioning her body, covered from head to toe with boils. One of the greatest hymn writers ever. She writes, he giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials his multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. His love has no limit, his grace has no measure, his power has no boundaries known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus he giveth and giveth and giveth again. I'd heard of you by the hearing of my ear. Now I've seen you. I abhor myself. I'm horrified. Creator, designer, revealer, comforter. Thirdly, he comes as mediator, savior. I know that my redeemer lives and I shall see him in my flesh. At the heart of the gospel is a story of suffering. The captain of our salvation was made complete through suffering. See, sin is brokenness. It's brokenness. It shatters purpose. It's a violation of purpose. So Pilate gets into the cockpit, 140 some innocent passengers sitting in the back. None of them knew this man was going to violate the purpose for which that commercial flight was designed. Sin is a violation of purpose. And when we violated the purpose and the solidarity of it, brokenness came and we share in that brokenness. And the only way back was through this suffering savior who showed us what evil really does and conquered the grave to offer forgiveness for you and for me. The greatest victory in life is not often the healing of the body, it is the healing of the soul. It's a story I was telling my colleague and one or two others in the last week. I was involved in a conversation to a person where there was a lot of pain and he was making some choices. And when I went to see this individual, I had no hope. But I just prayed, prayed very hard, got on my knees, and I drove that 45, 50 miles to see, and sat down in the car and chatted. So I just want to talk to you. The choice that is being made is not a good choice, and I'll tell you why. And we chatted. When I drove away from there, there were tears running down my face because I'd seen a miracle. I'd seen a miracle from a heart determined to go in one direction. The heart turned in another direction. I didn't do it. I can't do it. But God can. God does. The Savior that he gives to you and me, as somebody in Cambodia said to me, we don't need more politicians here now. He said, we need a savior. Somebody who can rescue us. My next engagement at the end of this week begins in Armenia, in Yerevan, where they are commemorating the 100th anniversary of the genocide of the Armenian Christians. That wound is still fresh, 100 years later. But I have, we have in our colleagues, team, those from there who are with the nation that victimized them. And there is no ill will, just a healing, bond of healing. Some of you may have heard my, my colleague, Nabil Qureshi. Nabil is from Pakistan. I'm from India. Enough said. <laughs> and yet, here we are, 
as close bond brothers in the faith because we have a common Savior and a common Heavenly Father. I just want you to know the Savior that God gives to you and me provides a transformation of heart because I'll tell you why. The worst effect of sin is manifested not in pain or suffering or bodily defacement but in the discrowned faculties the unworthy loves the low ideals the brutalized and the enslaved spirit the worst effect of sin is manifested not in pain or suffering or bodily defacement but in the discrowned faculties the unworthy loves the low ideals and the brutalized and enslaved spirit that's why the worst kind of crimes are not committed sometimes by the neediest but the most sophisticated I know that my Redeemer lives and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is this story and I just say to you that if Christ be not raised from the dead we are of all people most miserable but if Jesus indeed rose again from the dead and rises offering us to be our Savior now but the judge in the end so the man who takes out a sword and lops off the head of another human, human being in some grandiose expression of power and brutality, man has a judge waiting for him. Man has a judge waiting for him because he has violated the image of God in murdering a human being. That's what Genesis 9, 6 says justice and the balances will be set straight hope and forgiveness is offered in our Savior if we would come to him so he comes as creator designer revealer comforter mediator savior and lastly a strengthener and restorer strengthener and restorer Job received all the strength back that he needed all the healing of his wounds and he looks at his friends and offers to pray for them you know it's a remarkable story at the end when God gives you back your strength and God restores you that's why the Bible says I has not seen ear has not heard neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him neither has entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. So creator, designer, revealer, comforter, mediator, savior, strengthener, restorer. Job finds that connection back. I want to make three or four applications and then close. Application number one. If, if meaninglessness came from being weary of pain I would understand the problem as being singularly unique but it's not so G.K. Chesterton said meaninglessness does not come from being weary of pain meaninglessness ultimately comes from being weary of pleasure it is ironic to me I wrote a book on an imaginary conversation between Oscar Wilde and Jesus and Pascal Pascal and Wilde had their funerals in the same church, so I brought the two personalities in. But Oscar Wilde's grave in Paris, a huge, huge phoenix, and the verse of scripture that he chose to put on his stone, is a verse from Job. A hedonist going to Job? You see, when he was dying, he looked at his lover and he said to Robbie Ross, did you ever love one of those boys for their own sake? It's a telling moment. A hedonist now wanting a definition for love. Robbie Ross says no. He said neither did I. Bring me a priest. And in his Ballad of Reading Jail, he describes his life that only blood can cleanse my blood. 
right now. I don't know all the ramifications. I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the explanations for him. But I want to just say this. As a hedonist, he looked to Job to describe his life in the end. Meaninglessness. If you're living a sensually driven life right now, I can tell you, you're moving towards total emptiness. Meaninglessness does not come from being weary of pain. Meaninglessness comes from being weary of pleasure, which means purpose and meaning have to be defined transcendingly over the two poles of pleasure and pain. Secondly, it is this. When belief in God becomes difficult, the tendency is to turn away from Him. But in heaven's name, to what? What? That was Chesterton's question. Do you have a worldview that gives you an answer? May I suggest to you as a naturalist, not only will you not find an answer, I'm not even sure you can justify the question. Because if, he, if, he, if suffering is evil, then you must assume good. If you assume good, you must assume a moral law. If you assume a moral law, you must posit a moral law giver. But that's whom you're trying to disprove and not prove. If there's no moral law giver, there's no moral law. If there's no moral law, there's no good. If there's no good, there's no evil. The question evaporates. And you say, wait a minute, that was too fast. <laughs> you say, why do I need a moral law giver? I'll tell you why. Because the question of evil and suffering is always raised by people or about people, which means the question assumes people have intrinsic worth. That's an assumption you cannot make in a naturalistic framework. You need a transcendent creator, essential worth, in order to talk about essential worth for you and me. Otherwise, we are the random product of time plus matter plus chance. I think we have to think about that. Number three, and it is this, and my fourth one will be very brief here. There's a little gal, there's a young gal in Georgia by the name of Ashlyn Blocker. She's born with a disease called SEPA, congenital insensitivity to pain with anhydrosis. Very rare disease in this world where the person doesn't feel pain. But there's a problem. They could step on a nail and not know it. They can put a hand on a burning stove and not know it. And so she has to be watched, even when she is involved in sports, any time. And the mother in an interview said to the interviewer, my prayer every night is, dear God, please let my daughter begin to feel pain. If in this finite world, pain is an indicator to us that something is wrong, is it impossible? in the mind of an infinite God to have pain as a reminder to us that we must turn to him both for grace of forgiveness and grace of sustenance. Pain can be a blessing and an indicator. And the last thing I say to you is in the greatest chapter that the Apostle Paul wrote, I think, 1 Corinthians 13, if you go to Corinth today outside the church, it's on marble. Way up there is where the brothels used to be. But his sermon on love. And he ends with that incredible statement of the three great supremacies of life. In the end, there abides faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. The three supremacies of life, faith, hope, and love. None of those are possible, is possible, without pain. Faith will always be tested. Hope will always be daunted. Love will always stagger with other issues. But they are the great supremacies of life. So when I was writing my book, I was writing it in Jakarta, and I had lunch with a Chinese pastor of one of the largest churches in the country, Stephen Tong. He and I sat at his table with a very meager lunch. 
he said to me, what are you writing about? I said, pain. He said, Dr. Ravi, I'm older than you. Let me tell you something. Pain is necessary in life. And we continued eating. <laughs> I said, tell me about your life. When he started to unfold his story, he knew what pain was. And I walked away from there and told a friend, I've just seen an illustration of how to triumph through trials and be ministering to people all over the world with the voice of a veteran and the heart of a pastor evangelist. Ladies and gentlemen, those who have wisdom the best are those who have faced much and still endured with their faith unshaken in God. God bless you. Thank you so much. <clears throat>
Very interesting how Satan used that caution from God. God never gave hundreds of laws. He just gave one prohibition. One. Anything you want. With all the beauty around, just don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, Satan twists it and says, you know why that caution was given to you? Because in the day you do that, you will actually be God. He is God. Knowing good and evil, what he really meant was, you can play God and define good and evil. Now, having eaten of that one tree, look at our situation now. All the trees around us are protected except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And so if we do a health care law, we have to have thousands of pages writing. Why? Because every law that's made dies the death of a thousand qualifications by somebody who can manipulate it. You get into a plane and you, they tell you not to touch, tamper, disable or destroy the smoke detector. Just tell me, don't mess with it. Why do you want to tell me to touch, tamper, disable? Because you go to a court of law, a fellow says, I didn't touch it, I merely disabled it, you know, this sort of thing. All these kinds of things can happen. And our law courts have become places where the manipulation of law has become proverbial so that people have learned to even distrust the legal system. Why? because we redefined good and evil. And so when the redefinition of good and evil, all of creation is fallen. For me to say that as a wave is coming up against me, God should put his hand out and stop that wave. Think of how many laws will have to be re-established and rewritten. And today it may be a wave, tomorrow it could be a car. I may be crossing the road. Why doesn't God stop that car that is about to hit me? What you're really asking for is a situation where we'll no longer be human and no longer be finite, but it's just as easy, isn't it, for God to stop a tsunami as it is stop it to stop a bullet that is aimed at me. The reality is that in this world where we have violated God's law, death is a reality, suffering is a reality, God gives us the strength to go through this and triumph through this. I have seen people endure so much pain, so much suffering, and their faith is still strong in God who has sustained them. So to ask for a wave to be stopped is really no different than to ask that a maniacal pilot be stopped in the process. This is life's hard core reality. We conquer not in spite of the dark mystery of evil, we conquer through it in understanding what it is. So I say this Christian worldview gives you the reality of a fallen creation and to stop everything that would be in the way of my life is basically asking me to be something other than human and other than contingent. I am a contingent, I am a dependent being. At some stage, suffering and death will come. The cause may vary in different cases. I have learned through it all to trust him in his purpose. There's a last day written for you in the book of life. There's a last day written for me. I travel over 200 days every year. When I pack, I never know if I'm coming back home. Sometimes I'm going to the most dangerous areas of the world. I've all just learned to say, Lord, you order my steps, you stop my steps. And when my time is up, just make me ready to meet you, however and wherever that happens. I think that's the only way to march through this rather than questioning a wave or a car or a plane to live in the trust that your times are in his hands, as is this world. That's my answer to you. Thank you. All right, Ravi, this one is a uh, somewhat of a more personal nature. A uh, person writes in this, I feel like I can't trust a God who says he is sovereign, but then allows atrocities like child prostitution or child rape to occur. If God is sovereign, then he can stop it. Why does he choose not to protect these children? 
Yeah, I think it's, it's a really different slant to the same question, but I like the use of words there, atrocities. <clears throat> so that's a choice that some person, and by the way, you know, in our ministry, my daughter Naomi, her entire work is in the rescue of women and children at risk and prostitution and so on. She's seen it eyeball to eyeball and it just about burned her out and she's taken me to those places I've seen. It is a horrible thing to see how people in their own countries can allow their children to be victimized. I have a friend in the audience who works in law enforcement and that's his entire field. He's sitting right here in this audience and the stories he tells me that he sees are just uh, horrific. And the caution that I'm now hearing is that some academic is going to come around now and start talking about the fact that child sexuality is okay. We need to be giving them the privilege of all of this. And watch it is going to happen because we have educated ourselves into imbecility and somebody is going to come and give some kind of argument for this. <clears throat> so, it's the old story of Camus' book, The Plague. You know, that's what it is, you know, when you think about it, Joel. I just say two or three things to you. Number one, may your heart always be sensitive to that kind of need. Always. You see, at the end of your life, one of three things will happen to your heart, says F.W. Borum. You'll end up with a hard heart, a tender heart, or a broken heart. A hard heart, a tender heart, or a broken heart. Nobody escapes. Keep that tender heart where you see this kind of need give, support those works, rescue, help, find ways, because these are evils being perpetrated by people. And the worst kind of this now has been legitimized in the pornography industry, where there are actually predators who will use children, and there are consumers out there whose mind has become so perverted that they will consume this stuff. We need to find ways of protecting the youngest amongst us. But we always need to know this is a dastardly thing. And it is happening. It is because of the wickedness in the human heart. And that's, I think, the important point, Joe. When we see something so extreme, we think of it as wicked. If it just happened one or two cases, we'll bypass it. But seeing something dramatic like this, we have to brand it. And the second thing I say to you is, Christ laid down his life for you and me while we were yet sinners. We need to take that gospel message. I'll give you a simple application in this. I've spoken at Angola prison in Louisiana. 5,000 plus prisoners that have just been invited back will be going there in the fall. It was the most deadly prison in the country. 85% of them are on life without parole. When you checked in there, you were given a knife to protect yourself. I spoke there. The, ch the warden came there some years ago and he asked the governor for permission. Let me run this my way, I'll change this place. He put a Bible in every cell. He had chapel every day, brought in a theological seminary to help them study for their degrees. It has become the safest prison now, and I want you to know something. I was told by some of the chaplains there, you bring a lovely girl and walk past these cells, you will never hear a foul language, you will never hear a cat call. Profanity is not allowed in that prison by either the staff or the prisoners. And one of them told me, we've got bands of thugs transformed into bands of pastors. And when you see, <clears throat> when you see their lives changed and their lives transformed by the power of the gospel, even though they are spending the rest of their lives out there, when you see such evil and suffering, remember there's only one hope, and that hope is in the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's find ways. I'll tell you, one of the men I miss most in my life now is Chuck Colson. I don't know if we really replaced a man of his caliber, what happened in his life, and all that he did in prisons with people who've done such things, committed such heinous acts. Find ways of bringing rescue and relief, but no, it is an evil, and it is only an evil if life has a purpose. If life doesn't have a purpose, it is not evil anymore. And so the question has to be weighed out. 
It's suffering and pain, and you and I are called to the rescue. The church needs to be more involved. This, when I go to places, I, I get in, I'll never go alone. When I go into these red light districts with people who invited me, we talk, we speak, we see lives transformed. And with the young, keep them from pornography, because that's the starting point, oftentimes, of victimizing the younger as life goes on. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, we talked uh, this evening, uh, you, you talked about the power of the resurrection and the importance of that. And a question here uh, says that if Jesus' death and resurrection give us hope for the future, then uh, why did God leave us so little hope for people <clears throat> suffering here in the present? Uh, is a question that. Kind of the distinction kind of I think there's the uh, sense that we have uh, yeah. eternal life and a great hope in the future but what do, we, what do we do about the present you know this the old story of the guy who was talking about all the conversions that were taking place in India and uh, another man said you know I went there I didn't see any of that and he said what did you go to do he said I went to hunt tigers and the man said funny I didn't see any tigers in India what were you hunting you know, what you're looking for is what it is that you're, you're really going to find. I see an awful lot of people who live with hope, even in the dark and dismal days. It's amazing what I've, I, I, miss it, I minister a lot to our military bases. I've been in Ramstein, I've been in the hospital there. I've seen guys without limbs lying on the hospital bed and a Bible next to them and just telling me without Christ they would never have made it. They've got that hope. It's a story I'll never forget. I have to be careful how I word it. Probably 15, 20 years ago, I was in this city, <clears throat> and the pastor of the church said there was a young woman in her 20s or so who wanted to know if I would come and visit her. She was dying of AIDS. So I went to the pastor, right here in your city, and uh, I arrived in this, never forgotten this, arrived in this apartment building, and as soon as we entered the door, a friend opened the door and I remember looking down at her there and she had dwindled down to a bag of bones. Very pathetic, very sad. And I went there and uh, she just said, I listen to you on the radio all the time. You've done more for me than I could ever say to you. Will you pray with me, please? And just ask God to continue to sustain me. I made big mistakes, but I've come to know Christ and I really know He is my comforter, He is my present help. So I just held her hand, prayed with her, and we chatted a long while, and um, she was a beautiful gal, very much with a tender faith. And it, after I got up to walk away, I noticed on her coffee table was R.C.'s, R.C. Sproul's book on the hunger for significance. And I've never forgotten that. Well, the body was wasting away what she really wanted more than anything else was to feel significant in life again. And she died uh, not long after that. I see a lot of people with that kind of hope. If you're truly committed to him, truly trust in him, you'll find that hope. It's only when you're living devoid of that faith that you don't have that hope. And I just see a lot of it as I travel and I walk away saying, wow, I don't know if I could really have this kind of faith in this kind of a situation. It's there. I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Christ is talking about the now and is not just about beyond the grave. And I would just say to you, if you are one of those who is hurting and doesn't have that hope, Give God the chance to do a miracle in your own life, to bring that hope. I want to tell you a personal story. I don't often repeat this because I feel nervous about telling this story. <clears throat> I injured my back in 1985 and lived with agony. And I told you two, two, uh, two uh, sur surgeries and I still, I mean, I have a very stiff back, but the pain just wouldn't go away would lock my SI joint and traveling around was agony, you know. About two Junes ago, actually 2012 I think it was, I was at home and I got a telephone call from a friend of mine, his name is Duang Singh. He was on my board in Singapore. He's the CEO of, a of Gillette for Asia Pacific. 
He said, Ravi, can I come and see you? I said, Dew, I'm leaving tomorrow for five weeks. I really need this time with my family. He said, I have to see you. Give me just 15 minutes, please. I thought, my goodness, something bad is happening. So I said, all right, Dew, I'll meet you for those few minutes, and then I'll rush back home, pick up my bags, and head to the airport. You have to come close to where I'm staying. He said, that's fine. So we sat down, we'd ordered our quick breakfast, and he looked at me, and he didn't even touch his food. He said, every morning before I get out of bed, I lie there and I just say, Lord, speak to me. Whatever you have to say to me, I'm not going to pray, ask for anything. But just speak to me. I want to hear you. He said, because I was in your city here in Atlanta, he said, yesterday you were on my mind. And he said, I heard God's voice inside me telling me something he wanted you to hear. I thought, this is what I've come for? My goodness, you know. <clears throat> he said, the first thing God wanted me to say to you is, Ravi, the anointing on your life and the years to come is going to be even greater than the years that have gone by. I just looked at him. He's a man I love, respect, admire. I said, not you. You really heard that from God? He said, yes. He said, but after that I heard something else and I don't know what to make of it. That's why I wanted to see you. He said, God, speaking to me, said, tell Ravi, even though he will live with some difficulties in life physically, I'm going to take care of him, three, four, five. He said, Lord, I don't know what you're saying. He said, you tell Ravi, he'll know what you're saying. I'm saying. So he says, I'm here to tell you he's going to take care of you, three, four, five. He said, does it mean anything to you? I said, when you say three, four, five, I only think of two of my herniated discs, L3, 4, and L4, 5. He started crying. He said, where are they? So I showed it to him, right? the belt line there. He put his hand on my back and he prayed for me. And he wiped away the tears and he left. I went back home and I told my, my wife, I said, Honey, I want to tell you what happened this morning. Please don't tell anybody when this is what happened. <laughs> she said, Okay. I took my trip. My traveling associate, Crin, was with me. We were driving and flying along. Second stop, going through security. I sat down to tie my shoelace. I never do that. I could only kneel because I couldn't cross my legs. I'm bolted down. I just didn't have the flexibility without even thinking. I sat down, crossed my leg, tied my shoelace. He just looked at me. What are you doing? I, thought, I didn't know what I was doing. From that day till now, zero pain in my back after suffering since 1985. Does God work on a timeline? Yes. Why do He allow me to suffer for those 27 years? I have a feeling when I see Him the question will disappear because I'll be more worried about what He's going to ask me than what I'm going to ask Him. So I, I really just uh, believe that uh, God has His purpose and His time in what, and that hope is not just for the future, that hope is right for right now. You can live with that hope. Okay? Yes, Go ahead. Yeah. I think we'll take two more questions. Okay. How's that sound to you? And don't run away. After those two more, I want a closing statement yeah. for five minutes, and you want to hear that one. All right. All right. This one is uh, uh, one you hear from time to time in today's world. As people examine uh, the Bible, uh, it says it seems that God brought about a lot of horrendous suffering in the Old Testament. You have the stories of all, all horrendous things that happens to nations. How do you reconcile the kind God in the sense of the New Testament with this description of God in the Old Testament? How does that work out? It's not an easy evening, is it? You know, I had better evenings than this. <clears throat> yeah, I've heard that, you hear that. It's really a misunderstanding of God's uniform activity in the Old and the New. Let me put it this way for you. When God made the covenant with Abraham, Abraham was sound asleep. And God marched, walked through the cut up pieces of the animal making a covenant. The boy is sound asleep. God is basically saying, let that be done to me or what has been done to this animal if I should violate my part of the promise. Which means God's promise was immutable, indestructible. It was so certain because God cannot ever not be. 
God is a necessary being. It's impossible for God to not exist. And so that's how certain the promise was. It was purely an act of grace that he gave Abraham that kind of a commitment. That's the first thing. If you have never read the book of Hosea, it is probably the most beautiful book on the love of God you will ever read. Hosea is a prophet. He's married to Gomer who becomes a prostitute. And he has to go and stand in line to buy her back for half the price of a slave and a day's rations. Imagine him standing in the brothel, buying his wife back for himself and for the children. And he's commanded by God to go love her beloved of her adulterers. That's God's love. And the people, of course, are saying, what kind of a prophet do we have? You know, he's going around buying his wife back from a brothel. And the prophet probably said, you got that message? Uh -huh. Now I want to ask you, what kind of a God do you have who comes to us as a people who've played the harlot? That's why William T. Ewer said, how odd of God to choose the Jews. But how odd are still are those? who reject whom God chose. He could have gone to Greece, philosophy. He could have gone to Rome, glory. You know, he, he could have gone to Babylon, splendor. He went to the tiniest little nation, bullied by Rome, mocked by Greece, enslaved by Babylon, and said, come close, come close. Look at my eyes. When you see my eyes, you'll see a miniature reflection of who you, of, of you in my own eyes. You alone have I loved all the nations of the earth as he chose the nation that was going to be so resistant and so hard. And so I say to you, God's love is splendidly displayed in the Old Testament. You see it in all of the expressions as he gives them a covenant people. And I say to you, I was a useless, up to nothing kid who only knew best how to skip school. Wanted to become a cricketer, and that's all I lived for, wanted to play cricket. And my dad just was, gave up on me, he said, this is a disaster. Why on earth does he send a man to a hospital room to give me a Bible? I will never question his love. God's love is without measure. He came into my hospital room looking for me. The man who led me to Christ, his kids listen to my podcasts all the time and they're now the grandkids. The man who led me to Christ passed away two years ago. He was living in Los Angeles at that time. He was an Indian man. And a week or so before he died, he phoned me. He said, Ravi, I watch you on YouTube. I read your books. And I cry and I say to myself, is this why you brought me into the world? To take a Bible to this young kid when he was dying in Delhi. And I say, Fred, God brought you into the world for a lot more than that. I want you to know God's love is uniform across the world. Who would have ever thought that he'd be doing what he is in China today? And the testimonies are riveting what he's doing in Islamic countries today where dreams and visions are coming to those in the behind closed doors and the transformation of the human heart. I could tell you story after story after story of some of the most incredible conversions we are seeing. He's not a God of hate in the old and love in the new. It's the same God who judged in proportion to the revelation that was given there was an abundance of miracles given to the people and those miracles were ignored and the judgment was as dramatic as that to remind us that if he gives you incontrovertible evidence more shall be required of you. So the demonstration of God's grace was as dramatic in those days as it was the judgment and the provision was born out of love. The judgment was born out of holiness and we need to hold those in reality as twin expressions of a perfect and a loving God. Okay, I'll leave that with you. <clears throat> One more.
All right, uh, a final question, uh, yes, Ravi. Uh, this is true in the United States and uh, maybe in other parts of the world, but uh, first of all, there are many people who say they believe in God. Uh, and even in the United States, in this question, there are so many who say they are saved, yet how come we're not seeing more change in the world? Is it a lack of true belief? You know, it's very interesting to me <clears throat> That was the first most difficult question that was asked of me when I'd first come to know the Lord in Delhi. I was sitting across in a room with my, who's now my brother-in-law. Uh, he became a nuclear physicist in Canada and then gave that up and became a pastor. He's married to my sister and he and I were sitting in this room talking to his cousin. And his cousin looked at us and said, you know what, I've seen a change in you guys' lives. There's no doubt about it. He said, but there are so many others who claim to be Christians, I don't see any change. And, uh, you know, as he looked at that, he said, uh, his point was, we claim that you claim that this is supernaturally done within the human heart. Ought not I be able to see more change, more dramatic change, if this is indeed a God act activity? He had a point, and I had to think and think on that deeply. I haven't seen him now for 50 years. He contacted me a month ago. He says, hey, bud, I watch you on YouTube all the time. What happened to you? He lives in Singapore. He says, I want to talk to you. I want to meet. And so I'm going to Singapore in a few weeks and we are set up. He's the head of CEO of a company there. And it's wonderful that we'll be seeing him. So first of all, I have to ask that as an indictment upon you and me. I have to answer, answer that question. Have you demonstrated that change that Christ has brought in your life? Are men and women going to just hear your arguments or are they going to see those arguments? It's critically important that we live out the life and demonstrate what it is that God has done in our heart because we're living in a generation that listens with its eyes and thinks with its feelings. So if they're listening with their eyes, we have to live it out. Number two, let me just say this. Think of the universities this country has had, you know, Joe, because of Christians. Think of the hospitals because of Christians. If you have not heard David Cameron's challenge to the nation on Easter Day in England, it's brilliant, powerful. I wish our leaders had the courage to say what he said. He gave a powerful talk. Just Google a David Cameron Easter message. And he reminded the people of England. And you know what he said? He said, we are a Christian nation. He said, we are built on Christian principles. He said, and at Easter, as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, let's remember all the good things that Christians have done. Cameron said this. There are hospitals that they visit. There are shelters that are there. They give food to the hungry. They clothe the naked. I myself have benefited from the kindness of Christians in our country. They are in these needy places. Think of Dr. Kent Brantley, who's just come back, willing to contract Ebola. In the thick of that crisis, he and his team were there, willing to risk their own lives. They are doing it. They do it in many, many parts of the world. Now, if there's no personal change, sometimes that change comes slowly in some. Be patient with them. The good thing you do recognize is that if we claim to follow Jesus Christ, we must be living it and live with example. What I do want to say to you is this. People often say, look at Europe today, you know, they're without God and look how they are surviving. Europe wouldn't be in existence today the way it is if it weren't the Christianized nations who'd come to their aid some 60 years ago, believe me. It was the Christian convictions of the nations that preserved the integrity and the protection of these nations. And number two, these countries that are evicting God. Last week, the Canadian Supreme Court voted to ban prayer before any council meeting. We think we're going to get away with all of this. We think it's okay that we can put on our robes or sit behind desks and cavalierly decide we can do without God. It was Alexander Solzhenitsyn who warned America, we don't want you to pay the price of monstrous death and slavery that we've paid. He was harking back to the last act of Joseph Stalin 
who died with his fist clenched towards the heavens. We may not be in our beds clenching our fist towards the heavens, but we sure are behind lecterns and behind podiums and behind decision-making places, and we think we're going to get away with it. Watch Europe over the next 15 to 20 years, and then let's talk about this, because nature abhors a vacuum. Nature abhors a vacuum. The vacuum of secularism either has to be embracing the person of Christ or a demagogic, dominating, enforcing religious worldview will come in and take its place. Secularism does not have staying power. And Europe can ultimately... We are watching Europe change before our eyes. I, ta I, I do many prayer breakfasts. I do, I do it in just about every continent. And I tell them this. Watch what's happening. Culture is being systematically dismantled because nothing will hold you at the center. And it is the person of Christ who brings unity and diversity within and who brings unity and diversity without. Yes, as Christians, we have to love others whom we disagree with as well. I realize that. But I am saying this to you. The values, the values engendered by the Christian faith is what will keep a nation together. Otherwise, we create chaos. And so I just say to you that as we view what is happening in our culture and in our global scene, that the changes that we look for must first come within the individual. And if we as Christians and we as those in our churches live for Christ, it will spread to other parts of society too. It's a challenge to us as believers to live out the Christian faith and they have a right to expect that from us. They will see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Let your light so shine before men. So I take that as a warning and as a reminder. I want to close this time. And uh, just before I left my room, I in prayer, I looked, I wrote to a friend of mine and I said, do I have permission to quote your letter which came to me last week? This is a fighter pilot in the United States Air Force. About four weeks ago he wrote to me because our daughter was about, had just given birth and we had been given all kinds of warnings that all kinds of things could go wrong. We just labored through that. I flew back from overseas. And as it turned out, by God's grace, she had a healthy little boy. He's fine. But some symptoms were there for Jason and his wife. Kara, I think, is her name. I met Jason. He's a fine. He's just authored his first book, actually. He's talking about his own life and serving the armed forces and so on. But now this story. And he said, Ravi, my wife is about to give birth. We've received horrible news. I just want to know what was happening with your daughter, with these, the symptoms, and so on. He said, we've taken some tests. The news is grim. We may not have this baby for long. And on the day that the baby was born, Jason wrote to me. I know that our time with little Boone will bring glory to God. I have been writing since this began. We're not ready to share yet, but the day will come and I have released this to you. And what he had written to me was just looking for the background in that story. Sorry, I lost that here. Uh, I was sure I had it here before I came. Okay, I'll find it here. That was just a follow-up to my, here it is. Okay, here it is. Ravi, thank you so much for your prayers. We knew our little one would have big challenges. It was our hope that Boone would be born alive and that we would be able to hold him and if his spirit went to be with the Lord, he would be in our arms. That is exactly what happened. Boone Shepherd Lloyd was born early this morning and he was beautiful. He 
He neither struggled nor fought. He took a single breath and made a single sound and then remained mostly still. He appeared to have much peace, like he retained the comfort of the womb even on the outside. Perhaps that is what it is truly like to be in the arms of the Lord Jesus. Our hearts are heavy, but we have peace. God bless you, Ravi. You'll never know. He goes on to say that. So they hold a little babe in their arms, takes a couple of breaths, and they got at least that desire to hold them, and then he was gone. And he says, maybe that's what it'll be like for us to be in the arms of our Lord and rest completely in peace. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the example of faith that remains unshaken, that you can still keep going on. And what I started to read for you is what he just wrote to me before I came. He said, please feel free to share that story. I'm not ready to write about it yet, but I will someday. And I'm just praying that I will get to see him again as I know I will. And they look forward to seeing their child. Heartaches are all around. Without faith, you will never make it. Faith in the living God who carries you over the bumps of the road. Without him, not only do you not have the comfort, you really don't even have a legitimate question. God is our comforter, our healer, our restorer. And as I close, I want to say this to you. If you don't know Christ tonight, Please make it a point to meet him tonight. You'll never have all the answers, but like the song leader says, why do I never get an answer when we're knocking on the door with a thousand million questions about hate and death and war, because when we stop and look around us, there's nothing that we need in a world of persecution that is whirling in its greed. It's a rock musician actually saying this. Why do we never get an answer when we're knocking on the door? And it ends by saying, I'm looking for someone to change my life. I'm looking for a miracle in my life. I think it's a Moody Blues song from years gone by. You can have that miracle. Don't leave this place without praying and trusting him and put your hand into his hand. He will take you into the darkness and he will give you the light that you need to walk through it. May God bless you. Let me pray for you as we close. <clears throat> Lord, I have no doubt somebody's heart is breaking in this audience. Somebody's finances may be in trouble. Somebody's health may be in turmoil. Somebody may be facing a broken relationship. Somebody may be living in a home where there's heartache. You are the God who heals. You are the God who does miracles. Like a soft cloud come upon this audience and let them breathe that celestial air and know that you envelop us in your arms and we can rest in there. We need you, Father. Our nation needs you. We're in trouble. The world needs you. Come into my own heart in a fresh way tonight. Enter every heart as they have come in the hope of finding some answers. You are that answer. Walk with them. Talk with them. Comfort them. May you enter into many a life tonight for the first time. May they know you as Savior. In the name of my Lord and my Savior Jesus Christ. And I thank you for the C.S. Lewis Institute and the staff that brought it all together for your glory and giving me the honor of speaking in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.